Now we're going to talk about empirical formulas, and you first look at that name and you might think we're going to talk about empires like the Roman Empire or the evil empire in Star Wars, um, but it's not like that at all. Uh, the word empirical just means that the information was gathered from experiment or observation instead of from theory. Now in my class we just finished uh, learning how to name compounds and a lot of those uh, we just had the the, the names were given to us and we had to come up with the formulas from the names and that was all from theory. Now we're talking about situations where chemists can go into a lab and they can, they can break down a, a compound into its elements and measure the amounts of each element and from that we can derive what an empirical formula would be for that compound. Um, it may be the same as its molecular formula, it may not. Um, an empirical formula is just um, a formula that shows the lowest whole number ratio of the atoms in the compound. As I said, it may or may not be the same as a molecular form formula. For example, um, when chemists did this for water, they found that the, the ratio of the particles in, in the water was a ratio of two atoms of hydrogen for every one atom of oxygen. And, and as that turns out, that was the molecular formula as well as the empirical formula. But it's an empirical formula because it's in the lowest whole number ratio of the atoms. If one of your atoms is uh, shown uh, without a subscript, it means there's just one of them. That's the lowest positive whole number we can get. Uh, however, we could get ratios of say two to three or three to seven. Anything that you cannot uh, divide all of your subscripts by the same number, get some lower whole number ratio, uh, would show an empirical formula. Here's another uh, formula, that's C6H6, and we see, well, both of those sixes, we could divide both of them by six and get to a lower whole number ratio. So this is a molecular formula, but it is not an empirical formula. The empirical formula for this compound would be just CH. So here's a typical question we might encounter. And it says, in a lab, a compound was found to consist of 68.4% chromium and 31.6% oxygen. And the question is, of course, asking, what is the empirical formula of this compound? Well, there's a little, uh, a little poem that I came across. It's not a great poem, but it, it kind of helps us to remember what we're supposed to do in this one. And the poem goes, percent to grams, grams to mole, divide by small, multiply till whole. Again, not the greatest poem in the world, but it will help us with this if we step and say, well, what, what are, step through those, um, those different processes and see what we need to do here. So let's break this down. We start to say percent to gram. Well, the first step is um, you're, getting, you're usually given the percentages of the different elements in the compound. And what we can do is we can make our math life easier and just say, well, let's assume that we have 100 grams of the compound. And since percent means per 100, we can just automatically change those percent signs to grams. And if the problem is already in grams, of course, we don't need to convert the percent to grams. It's already in grams. We can skip this step completely. Our second step then is to convert those grams into moles using the atomic mass. Because what's important here is, is what we're actually working with in the lab. We usually are measuring things in grams. On the large scale of the world that we encounter, we're dealing with grams. We can't count the individual particles. But when we go to make a chemical formula, the chemical formula is on the basis of the individual atoms that are present, not on how much they weigh. So we have to go and convert from the grams into moles so we can get a ratio of the particles that are present. Our third step will be to divide by the, by the smallest number of moles present, present. Because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to get our lowest whole number ratio. Usually when you do this step where you're converting from grams to moles, you get numbers that are, that are fractions and full of decimals. And what we're trying to do is get some nice whole numbers. So if we take the smallest number of moles and divide it by itself, we're going to get that particular compound on the basis of one mole, because any number divided by itself is equal to one. But we have a, a ratio that we have to keep the proportions the same, so whatever we divide that smallest number by, we have to divide them all by that same number to keep our proportions consistent. And so this will keep our ratio and get us into the lowest whole number ratio. 
Now, sometimes when we do it, there'll be some compounds um, that still don't work out to be whole numbers. Sometimes after this step, they're all whole numbers, so you can stop here. And sometimes we need to keep going until we have this last step, which is now we have to multiply till they're all whole numbers. Um, and so if we've got something that maybe we have a ratio of, say, 1, 1 to 2.5, well, since we have a 0.5 in there, we'll want to double that to get rid of that half, and we're going to have to double all of our, our um, number of moles. And, and this step will probably be easier to understand once we see some examples. So we'll go back to that first question, and we'll apply our steps here. And our first step was percent the grams. So we just say, well, we've got 68.4% chromium and 31.6% oxygen. We just convert those immediately to grams because if we had 100 grams of this compound, that's how many grams we'd have. Our next step is to convert to moles. And to do that, we need to use the atomic masses from the periodic table. Now you may notice at this point that with the oxygen, we use the atomic mass of oxygen. It's really important because we just talked about this in my class where we said there are certain elements that exist in diatomic form. And if in, you're trying to find, say, the uh, molar mass of oxygen gas, you have to remember that oxygen gas exists as O2. Well, in this case, we're not talking about pure oxygen gas as it exists um, in its elemental form. We're talking about the oxygen that's in the compound. We really are interested in how many individual oxygen atoms we've got, how many moles of individual oxygen atoms we have. So we're just going to use the atomic mass for these calculations. Now you see we have a ratio of the moles, and our empirical formula is a mole ratio, but we need it to be the lowest whole number. So we'll go to our next step. Say we'll take um, our smallest number of moles and divide both of our number of moles by that small number. Obviously, the 1.3154 is our smaller of the two numbers. So we'll end up dividing both our number of moles by that so we keep our proportions consistent. And when we do that, of course, the chromium comes out to be 1. And the oxygen comes out to be 1.5. So what we, what we don't want to do here is if we're, if we're well away from a whole number, we do not want to just round off that number. We're going to have to figure out some way to get this to be a whole number by, by multiplying them. So we're going to go to the step four, say multiply till whole. Well, in this case, we have a 0.5 in one of our number of moles. And the way to deal with that is you're going to multiply by two. But whatever you do to one of your numbers, you're going to have to do to both to keep your proportions consistent. And when we do that, we find that what we really have here is a 2 to 3 ratio of the chromium to oxygen atoms, which means we can now translate this into a, a chemical formula for the compound. And we'd say this is, of course, Cr2O3. Now, a note about that multiply till whole. Really, most of the problems we're going to encounter um, we may have to multiply by 2, we may have to multiply by 3. Rarely will you get problems that, that have more than this. So if, you're, if your number of moles of one of your compounds ends in a 0.5, whether it's 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, etc., then you're going to multiply all your number of moles by 2 to kind of clear out that 0.5. If the decimal is somewhere near one-third or two-thirds, which would be 0.33 or 0.67, something close to that. It might be 0.34 or 0.31 or 0.65 or something, but something close to one of those numbers. Then what you're going to do is multiply all of your number of moles by 3. So we have another problem here. In a lab, a sample of a compound was broken down into its elements. A student determined that the sample contained 33.3 grams of carbon and 5.6 grams of hydrogen. What is the empirical formula of the compound? And I would recommend that you pause this at this point and try to work this out yourself. Kind of remember what we said about the, the little poem and which steps you may want to skip on that one. So as we look at our answer, the first thing we do is we, you know, the first line of the poem was percent to grams. Well, it's already in grams, so we're just going to use the grams that are given. The second step was grams to moles. 
So we're going to use the atomic masses to find out the moles of each element. And again, even though hydrogen as an element exists in diatomic form, and if we were to find its molar mass, we'd have to use H2. When it's in a compound, we just want the individual atoms of hydrogen, so it's appropriate to use just um, the atomic mass of one atom of hydrogen. Now what we need to do is divide by small. So we're going to divide both of them by the 2.772 and we find that we have a 1 to 2.004 ratio and that number there is close enough to round. If that was close to 0.33 or 0.5 we would have to multiply everything but 2.004 for an empirical formula, one that's done from experiment, that, that's, a, that's close enough to 2 so we can just round that to 2 and now we have a formula of CH2.